Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, brothers and sisters of the tribe, welcome to Savage in Business, the podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Kamich. I am the Savage in Business. And this one, I like to bring in friends, family, brothers, sisters, people out in the tribe, the business tribe out in the world who are doing something excellent, excellente, extraordinary. They're doing something absolutely magical with their lives, like all of us. They have trials, tribulations, triumphs, and tragedies as well while they do what? navigate things like life and business but there's lessons to be learned from these people sometimes you can learn from things that people don't do things that go sideways but more importantly guess what every time somebody's successful success breeds success and there are lessons to learn so that you can emulate it yourself so we're going to dive into it to another one of my brothers from another mother mr paul palmer the samurai is on with us today savage business and podcast paul it's a pleasure brother as always to be talking to you now let's do the 30 second elevator pitch so that everybody just gets to hear about you and how you got started as well. And then we're going to dive in, start talking about how you got such a cool thing going on and what life's been giving you up until now, but tell them just a little bit about you. Um, well, I guess how I got started in, in A to B was um, uh, maybe started more like 12 years ago when my son got into the sport of parkour and free running. Mm. Um, and I started to uh, research it when he first got into it, realized how dangerous it was, started doing it with him. So he and I have been a father-son parkour team that li literally traveled the nation um, doing competitions and uh, events uh, for about the last, uh, uh, traveling for about the last six years. And uh, three years ago, right uh, after COVID hit, we had the lockdowns and they offered employers money to lay people off. I was one of those people. And uh, at that point in my life, I was ready to do something new. So I uh, had been selling software um, and, you know, cloud migration services, things like that. Previously in my business development career, I called up a, a friend of mine who happens to be the first parkour world champion in the history of the sport, uh, Gabe Nunez, and said, hey, I, I want to apply the, you know, my business acumen of the sport of parkour to try to find a way to help monetize the sport for kids like my son. Um, and so he's like, well, that sounds dope. Let's start working on this new competition I've got. Oh, um, yeah. And that's really the, the short answer. That's how it started. Oh, I love it. Listen, man, everybody's got this, this origin story. You did it because you're just a dad. Now, yeah. everybody gets started in business. How did life start for you? How I got started in business, I, I guess it started like way back, if that's what you're talking about, when I went. Yeah, farm. absolutely. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I went, uh, I knew I needed to go to college, so uh, I didn't get scholarships. So the Army would would do the GI Bill and college fund. So that's how I got my college money. As I said, I'm going to sign up into the Army. So I'd never flown in an airplane. I'd never left Texas. So I signed up to be a paratrooper. Mm -hmm. My first flight was over to Fort Benning, Georgia, where I learned the fine art of being an infantryman. And then uh, went to airborne school and jumped out of uh, five planes and got my wings. And I did a tour in Berlin, Germany. I was lucky enough to be there during the fall of the Berlin Wall. So I spray painted my name all over it, brought a bunch of chunks home, got to you know, witness that part of history. But then I started in the business world. I started off getting a degree in marketing. So I came yeah. out of the yeah. army. I had some money to go to school. Um, I ran a family real estate company, started learning sales uh, by doing, you know, doing sales, worked that career for a good 30 years. I, I don't know how much history you want to go into, but most of my history is in software and software as a service. So I specialized yeah. in money movement. So back when we did paper checks in the 90s and early 2000s, paper checks were still at a very high usage. And it was because of 9-11. And when the when the towers were hit, there was a law that Bush signed after that. Because of that attack, you know, there was there was planes that were grounded and the, the Fed lost about seven billion in float because they couldn't cash checks. Right. So yeah, they, they made this electronification act that happened. And so I was involved in that and did a, a career in, you know, specializing in money movement at a high level. So my clients were like the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, Citibank, uh, Capital One, uh, you know, May stores, huge organizations that moved a lot of paper and wanted to convert it to electronic items. And then, you know, from that experience, just carried it on through, like I said, through a total of 30 years of business development now. I always find it intriguing that when you talk to people that got started and more importantly, the people that stick with it as well, 
some of the really successful people, and it's, this isn't a rule of thumb for everybody, but it's just always interesting how frequently it crops up that it's a great subsection. How many started out with military service? Like what a what an interesting takeaway because the the level of discipline and perseverance and all those are the great things that have to go into it that, that make, should you survive your career in any form of military service, really set the table next. What were some of those key takeaways? What were some of the lessons that you learned from those days and times that just seem to continue to apply forward. And now I just want to focus on your military service, obviously, but the, they certainly set a, a catalyzer for certain things. And that helps you to really begin to achieve in other areas of life. Well, you bring up military experience. And I heard something from someone else that they were asked the question, you know, how do you become wealthy? How do you become successful? You know, I want to learn the steps and all that. And the guy looked at him and said, you know, do 50 push ups a day. And the guy looks back and he's like, what do you mean do 50 push-ups a day? I'm talking about business, man. And he's like, yeah, that's the point. He goes, uh, you know, all business starts with discipline. And if you can't discipline yourself to do something that's good for you, you just literally do 50 push-ups a day, you'll see the benefits. Yeah. And if you do that, you'll learn the basis of discipline. And that's the very first thing you're going to need if you're going to even think about being successful in business. To your point, I completely agree. The gift that the military gave me However painful it was in its delivery <laughs> was, was beautiful in the fact that I learned how to self-discipline. And it wasn't that the drill sergeant standing over me, yelling at me, made me do it. I, I did every movement myself. I was the guy doing the yep. push-ups. And I found that motivation doesn't come from him. It comes from me. So it was finding that what we called in the military intestinal fortitude. Um, yeah. It's what I... When I, when I ran ultra marathons when I was 42, 50 Ks, you know, 31 miles at a time, it's intestinal fortitude you tap into in those moments. And I learned that, you know, at for like 19, 20, 21 years old. So this morning on my walk uh, around the golf course in my, in my house, I dropped down and I did, well, I do 52 because I'm 52 years old. So I did my yeah. 50 ups and then I kept doing my walk but yeah that's what I learned in the army and and you know I I learned my lesson by putting my face on the ground 52 times this morning and and knocking them out and it feels good you know I feel amazing oh, it feels great D now doing things when nobody's watching yeah. that's such a that's such a huge lesson for people to take away and that's followed you your entire adult life 30 yeah, years that's yeah, yeah, sorry if I cut you off, but yeah, this was no. before Sunrise that I was doing yeah. this. And what I, I'll grab a boomerang off my wall, which, you know, I make all of these, you know that, but uh, I'll take one of these boomerangs. I'll walk out on the golf course before sunrise. I'll do a walk. I'll drop down. I'll do my push-ups and get a nice walk in. And then as the sun comes up, I go out and throw boomerangs into the sunrise and welcome the day. And that's probably one of the best business principles I would say you can have is to is to start your day grounding yourself that time of meditation to where that when you go to do business you're clear-headed and you're not scatterbrained because you just woke up and you're slugging down yeah. coffee and you're trying to overcome the late night you had or whatever your bad habits may be i love that too because it's not like life isn't full of enough things that you can't have the odd bad habit here or there or certainly indulge or enjoy yourself but the start of your day and doing things when people aren't watching is a wickedly important lesson like that is staggeringly important for people to succeed at anything. Athletics, business, relationship. It's the it's the spade work you put in when people aren't watching. I heard as a kid, early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Mm -hmm. What in those 30 years to get you to this point? And we'll talk about what's the where all the cool stuff is in a moment. 30 years. There had to be a series of those insurmountable obstacles. You know, we could start with the best discipline in the world and we have the best endurance and the perseverance and really be disciplined in the way our practice, you know, we go about it every day because when people aren't watching, what was one of those moments where you weren't sure, man, I'm going to make it. We've all got those instances in life and those are often catalyzers that teach us lessons moving forward. I'd have to say that was about three years ago was probably one of the biggest and, and most relevant because it's when, you know, COVID happened. I was laid off. Here I am uh, about to be 50 and very dissatisfied with what I was doing. It was not fulfilling at all. And I was at that crossroads and I was just like, 
man, I, I just, uh, I don't know what I want to, what I want to do here. So I was, I was distraught selling things I didn't have a passion for. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever sold cloud migration services before, but it's hard to have a passion for things like Kubernetes. I just like, it didn't, it didn't uh, get me excited. You know what I'm saying? Like, I wasn't like, oh yeah. So I hired this career coach. I literally spent like five grand of money I did not have to spend. You know, you would think that, but of course I did. And it was worth every penny because I, you know, I, I found a way to do it. Got it done. From that, she says, well, we need to focus on things that you have passion in. One of those was a sport of parkour inspired by my son and I being this yeah. father-son parkour team that have really shaken things up in the parkour world are really well known. And I didn't think there was a lot of value there in the fact that, oh, I'd monetize that until I had someone kind of like push my face and go, look from this perspective and see how to monetize mm. it. The other thing I did that was monumental was I read a book <clears throat> from Napoleon Hill called Think and Grow Rich. And I can't book. tell you how powerful that formula is, which he got from 500 of the wealthiest people on the planet somewhere around 80 or 100 years ago. They, they ring true to this day. Every uh, great business person is following a very similar model to this. So I read that book several times. My copy is highlighted and notes in the in the margins and so with that i got on this mission that's where a to b was created from mm, fantastic brother listen we're going to take a short break here for a moment we're going to bounce right back in talk about how life's looking for you right now what else is going on but to finish off our segment here discipline begets a lot of practice challenges and hardship really kind of on things as well but you talked about being able to create adaptability a lot of people are very rigid in their thinking and adaptability is also wickedly important if something's not quite working being able to understand enough about yourself and say hey i got to do something different as well and finding resources to be able to do that that's always wickedly important absolutely we used to say in the army um uh, improvise and overcome absolutely brother and on that note hey brothers and sisters of the tribe out there we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back in just a moment. Brothers and sisters of the tribe, Savages in Business, Savage in Business, the podcast. We're coming back. We're talking to the great Paul Palmer, A2B.network. You need to get in there. You need to go check it out as well. He's doing something unique and wickedly cool inside of athletics in a spot that not a lot of things are happening right now, and I've never seen anything quite like this. Brother, Welcome back to our episode, of course. It's all about you. It's all about me just talking about sharing stories and providing education, insight, and advice to other people out there in the world so that they can follow along. Success leaves markers. You brought up Napoleon Hill. What have the last year, two years, three years looked like for you? And tell us just a little bit about what you're working on. Yeah, thanks so much, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, the, the concept of A to B came from the idea of, of Napoleon Hill, where he's like, you know, you create uh, value either through your own knowledge, someone else's knowledge, or a combination of those two. And so I knew that the value that I had was this business acumen that I had learned doing a lot of different types of business from a lot of different perspectives. And so that got me into, you know, working with uh, Gabe. We started working together on a, on a new event that he had, that he had started right before COVID. And it mm -hmm. was a competition and it was uh, in the sport of parkour. So it was a live competition, drop coordinates out in Los Angeles where the team were headquartered. It was a great success. The very next month is when COVID hit. And the lockdowns happened. And then LA you, you started you started an entire sporting event. Yeah, well, the, the sporting event has already been going on. Like, you know, parkour is a sport that's been around maybe 30 years or so. But it really got popular around 2007, 2008. That's when Red Bull started their uh, Art of Motion competition. That's when the smartphone came out and people started communicating online. This is a very well-connected community online, the parkour community is. It's so accessible to do parkour. You don't have to, like, go to a football field, say, or, or have a football or have another team to play against just you and an obstacle. So it makes it very accessible. So the growth of the mm. sport is huge. Tempest has been around since uh, 2007. It's a team started by four Hollywood stuntmen. They were also all involved in the sport of parkour in a very big way, like competing on the world stage. The very first world championships were held in 2008. 
Gabe Nunez uh, won that as a Tempest athlete. That team now has a host of world athletes in its cadre and a 15-year history of building the sport of parkour. And so I started working with Gabe about three years ago, right when this competition happened. And because of COVID, because of the lockdowns, it opened up the, the world of parkour to us and literally the world. So we went on Instagram and said, OK, we're going to open this up to a global competition. We started getting 100 to 200 athlete submissions every month from over 20 countries around the world. We started having winners in you know, multiple countries and, and you know, the U.S. not even uh, in, in the picture as far as the, the winners go. So we, we started building this beautiful, massive international community of parkour athletes. And we were getting, you know, about a million to two million views every month. We're doing this bracket style competition, head to head, this guy and this guy. And everyone votes, you know, who did a better line? This guy yeah. moves oh, yeah. for the competition. Well, that kept the audience going for seven to nine days a month. So we started getting some really impressive numbers. And then when this, uh, when the restrictions let up in April of last year, we did our first live competition out in Los Angeles. It was a, the, a throwdown with the best athletes in the world. And we had the largest cash prize in the history of the sport. It was a huge success. So uh, I've been working with this event. It's called Kings of the Concrete, presented by Tempest. Uh, so uh, so COVID was good for business. It was beautiful. You take adversity and you adapt. It's like we were talking about your AQ. It's your adaptability yeah. portion. Like, do you crumble and go, oh, God, there's a problem? Or do you go, all right, we can't go that way. Well, we might as well I go guess this is what we're doing now. So exactly. sure. Yeah. Yeah. You're in the, you're in the military. You, you know that. It's like, well, that big so, bridge just got blown in smithereens. Let's go. So this, this is way. what we're doing at this exact moment. Okay. Whatever. Good. Yeah. So, so ultimately, it was a good thing. Yeah, yeah, it did. It did wonders for us, but it really helped us unite this community. And and the whole time I'm out looking for sponsors. And so I've got a sales team that I hired that I work with and they're out banging phones and we're doing presentations and we're talking. And I've talked to over 100 different brands about, hey, you know, coming on, supporting the event and all that we're doing. And I kept hearing over and over. We love what you guys are doing. That is so sick. Like those guys, the athletes are amazing. And, you know, the content is unreal. Everyone loved it. And they were like, we want to work with your athletes. And so I started hooking up these little deals like Curex insoles with one of our world champions, like Sydney Olson, two-time female world champion. Um, yeah. So I started hooking up these little deals. And I thought to myself, I was like, hey, I'm going to be the Jerry Maguire of parkour. You know, that was my thought, you know, it kind of started in that form and I told that story enough times. And then there was a, a friend of mine that heard that, uh, a business associate, which is also a friend. It's the way we should all do business. But my friend and business associate turned me on to a technology that I could take my idea and make it mm. into a software as a service offering. And so he hooked this up. I get on the phone with David, my, my now partner, and he brought the technology piece. And so I, we had, you know, thousands of athletes as part of our group. Tempest has got a 5 million followers with itself and all of its uh, branches and athletes and all of that. And so we had this huge existing pool of talent of people that are in what I would call micro and nano influencer stages. We've got some guys that have six and a half million followers. They've blown up. They're, they're, they're making tons of money on Instagram and YouTube and all of that. There are those stories. And there's plenty of places for those guys to go and get help. But you take a guy like my son or, or the millions of other athletes that are like them, which we would call micro and nano influencers, like less than 100,000 and then less than 10,000. And those guys don't have a chance at getting big brand deals. Yeah. Um, yeah. The yeah. Other guy. And so I started piecing this together. I said, well, you know, if we added all of our guys up and we started aggregating those micro and nano influencers, we would have a really good talent pool. And the other thing about a micro and nano influencer is that the people that follow them do it authentically. There's no BS there. It's not like, you know, they're following Kobe Bryant or a big superstar just because they're they're a superstar. It's an authentic following. And so if a superstar says, hey, I like Pepsi, you know, people are like, yeah, sure you do. You're getting paid millions. But if you get on my Instagram and I've got less than a thousand followers and I say, I like this, people are going to be, oh, shit, he really likes it. I'm going to try it. So it's yeah. a much better conversion rate. I said, you know, if we took that and empowered all of these little guys, we'd be the big guy. 
So this is really built by the community for the community so that we can empower these athletes to take whatever they bring to the table and get monetized by it. And the other thing is we need to get them hooked up with brands that support them because there's brands who want this authentic user generated content that UGC, they want that authentic ground level stuff that, you know, shows people using the product that they're selling. And we have that. And so these guys are, we're going to give them a platform that they can get monetized for that UGC instead of just giving it away. We're also, we have an agency uh, embedded in there so that we can help the athletes so that they get representation and they're not being taken advantage of by a brand. There's also education for the athletes. There's just a, there's a huge value proposition for everyone involved. And this is one of the business formulas. Uh, if you're familiar with the Rotary Club, yeah. Uh, my organization, my dad's a 50 year something Rotarian. I was the founding president of the College Rotary Club at Sam Houston State University. I grew up with trash bags on the side of the road, you know, that community service uh, aspect. But the fundamental rule from there is from Rotary is that uh, it's part of the four way test. Does it build goodwill for everyone involved? Uh, does it do mm. something good for everyone involved? And another basic rule of business is that. You're going to be paid the amount of value that you bring to the market. And so with those in mind, we're creating A to B to bring a massive amount of value to the athlete, that micro and nano influencer who needs a, a, a central hub, which is what we're offering them to, to house all of their, uh, like a link tree, you know, a link in bio, a place to put all of your your links for all your social handles, which most of them are going to have three to five social handles, a place that they can describe themselves so that a brand could review them as a brand wants to look at talent. A place you're, to have a you're crafting from your community for your community and built the next passion project, but the next stage of your professional life by literally pulling on the threads of the people around you. Yes. Yes. What a wickedly important lesson to go hand in hand with when people can't see what you're doing every day and you get it done anyway, how it pays off, how discipline works really well how adaptability works really well. And ultimately that, that the tribe is wickedly important for you to succeed. Yeah. Love it. Brother, we're going to take another short break here right now. We're going to pop in, talk about what the future looks like. Hey, tribe that's out there, pay attention, pop back in. Part three is coming up right now with Mr. Palmer, the samurai himself. And we're going to dive in a little more, get some more good stuff for you. And of course, let him talk. The guy's a master at it. See you soon. We're back. The samurai himself, Mr. Paul Palmer, is here, and he's spilling the beans on his good stuff. Now, this segment as well is not just future-looking, but things that we want to pass on, right? Legacy, what the future's looking like for us, and the lessons that we've been absorbing up until this point, the stuff that's going to keep moving us forward. So let me ask one big question. In your mind, with everything going on up to right now, what's one of the biggest challenges you foresee that you think is going to be coming in the next two years? What's when you're looking down the road and we've been talking about, you know, discipline and being able to stick with things even when people aren't watching and adaptability and being able to lever into our community. But if you're forward thinking enough, you can always kind of see the forest for the trees. You can see where the path's going and then you start to get anticipatory. What are some of those challenges you see coming up ahead and just how are you planning to attack them? The biggest current challenge right now is securing funding. Yep. And, you know, aside from that, let's say post funding, the biggest challenge is going to be uh, hiring the right people yeah. and making sure that they have a clear understanding of the vision of where we're going and what we're creating and then supporting them in their role in creating that. Probably one of the biggest challenges because we're having to create positions, create processes and procedures for positions for people to, to execute this. I, I guess that's probably going to be the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges that we're going to face uh, as we move forward. Um, mm. How do you think you're going to, how do you think you're going to solve that one? I think by knowing people that we, you know, having more hiring done, uh, I would say internally or, you know, through connections, I think initially those key positions, because at the end of the day, this is a, a SaaS offering. So it shouldn't have a huge staff supporting it. It's really the, the software itself. And that's the other area that I see as the big challenges in building this software and coming from a software background. I've done this in the past where it's like, yeah, we're going to build this. It's going to take six months. 
And then you come back and like, ah, yeah, well, you know, give me two more weeks. And then, and then it's another two weeks. Like, I don't know if you've ever built a house, but it's like, I you know, just they keep pushing it back. And it's like, yeah, you know, with electrical, electrical stuff, you know, like two more weeks. Yeah. And so uh, there's another big challenge that I think, oh my God, we're going to, we're going to have to run into that as well. And it's kind of the same thing, which puts it in that category of, we got to, you know, uh, make sure there's a clear vision and then just help clear obstacles, which I think what that means to me ultimately is that I've got to be in very good communication with the people that are executing those roles so that we can clear those obstacles as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so that you're not sitting around waiting for one part of the engine to move. Like in any great uh, chain, we know that one, you know, one broken link, yeah, make the whole thing go down. So yeah. I think that's probably for myself, the biggest challenge that I'm seeing as the architect of this is making sure that all of the pieces are moving the way they should and that no one side or no one thing is dragging the rest of the team down. Um, mm. You know, I want to segue on that one for a moment. It's wickedly important. Lessons, ideas, and suggestions have just been spinning off of you. Somebody comes to you when they're young and they want to get started or somebody's just making the transition. You know, we're seeing a lot of life transition happen right now with people even at older ages where the idea or the challenge of, let's say, starting their own thing is becoming a reality when they were employed their entire lives. What's the one nugget or tidbit you pass on to people if they want to get, if they want to wade into something like this themselves? And maybe they want to compete with you, or maybe they just want to do anything else. But what's that bit that you that you give to somebody else or you wish somebody gave to you at the very beginning? Call someone that you have to be so let's say you want to be a thing, like I want to be in the sport of parkour and free running and business development. You've got to find someone that is doing the thing that you want to do and go talk to that person. And this is one of the things that I paid the, the career coach to learn. And this is the reason that I reached out to Gabe Nunez, first world champion parkour athlete, is because of this piece which takes your learning curve and accelerates it a huge amount. Finding someone who's doing, finding multiple people who are doing what you're doing until you can find someone that can help you along the process to help you either educate yourself to get to your goal or help with direct connections, or in my case, literally start a business with me because I reached out and, you know, mm. after through time, you know, created value uh, and now a guy that uh, I still look up to, but used to look up to like, oh my God, this dude, you know, this amazing guy. And then when I first met him, like, you know, almost 10 years ago, I realized how cool he was. And now to be a business partner with him, business partner with him to my younger kid self, little Paul's just back giggling like a, <laughs> like crazy, man. He's just like, this is the coolest shit ever. You know, I'm hanging with these Hollywood stunt guys. This is the funnest thing ever. I'm doing parkour with my son. We're traveling around just having a ball and holy shit, if I haven't found a way to monetize this for the community and I found the Love software it. that can make it happen. The, the people, the technology, it looks like the resources, the, the capital desire to make this uh, reality a dream. We just had a big investor come in literally two days ago with big name athlete that's going to come in and yep. be part of this and drop some hard dollars. So it's really catching some uh, momentum here. I see this growing at a very, very a fast rate. If you look at something like a link tree, you know, the link in bio where they take and aggregate all of your stuff into one little page. That has 30 million subscribers. That business wasn't a business, but what, seven or eight years ago? You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. the growth of these are so good. And the fact that we have this huge global population and a 15-year history with them through Gabe and through Tempest really just shows this to, to have that unicorn look, you know, something that's going to take off and that has that right combination. Mm -hmm. Businesses Love fail. It. You know, most of them fail, right, Mitch? 97% yeah. of businesses are going to, fail and i'm out there trying Gone. to say mine's not going to be the one that fails but i'm telling you mine's not going to be the one that fails this that's right will... amen brother amen i always love tossing a a fun question in whenever i'm talking to people as well get their perspective in life we're always tossed a little bit of a curveball or something we didn't quite expect what's something you've been asked in life particularly about business a question that you absolutely love getting asked something that somebody asked you and you didn't even think about it at the time and then you just went that was really cool. I love being asked that question, or it was a great thing to ask or advice that somebody's come to you and ask you for as well. We sometimes get surprised by people. 
So what's that one thing that you maybe didn't think you were going to be expected to answer or provide to somebody else, but was just a joy to be able to do? Got your thoughtful face. I don't know that there is is one that's jumping out specifically, you know, as as like, you know, tell us this specific thing. I think for me, the open ended question of, hey, can you just explain how this happened or, you know, this thing and that that platform to take the creative liberty to maybe take someone on a on a uh, a journey you know, where uh, you know, explain a story. And so, yeah, I, I think the the ones that I like the most are uh, the short ones and like, hey, man, you've got a really, really interesting story. Please tell us about it, and, you know, and, and kind of however you see fit. And it gives what? you, you're not, you're not pushed into this box of, well, tell me about the boomerang thing, Paul. Why, why the boomerang thing? Why that specifically? Now, that's a story in itself. But, you know, if you tie this into the great big picture and if you had that, you know, artistic liberty to, to give the if whole If we thing. had more time, asking you what you love about boomerangs is a great thing because that can go in any different direction. And that could go forever, brother. You may you may have to extend the podcast. You may have like <laughs> two listeners because it gets into some really crazy aerodynamics and it's it's fascinating. But there's not many people I can talk to about it because it's it's too far out there. Like you really have to to like this stuff to, to listen to that kind of a podcast there's maybe there is a future episode hey if you a hey, audience if you sit there and you go i want to hear about the boomerang thing then drop some notes in the comments in the future whatever platform you see it across because we're on everything as well and we will bring mr palmer back just to talk about boomerangs and aerodynamics because engineering is damn cool last question of the day you had to expect it was going to show up at some point podcast is called savage in business the podcast right what does savage in business mean to you and how do you see applying it for yourself in business you know the first time i heard savage in business it hit me and i was like wait a second like taking advantage of people you know savages like you know scalping that kind of stuff like no i'm not down for that then obviously i met you and then we became besties and all of that good stuff but now that i understand the philosophy i'm like Oh yeah, it's to me, savage means in the way that you approach what you're doing. And I think savages were savage because they were trying to feed themselves in a harsh environment, right? Mm -hmm. So they're hunting savagely. And we as business people are hunting savagely for deals. But when we do a deal, my deals, everyone wins or we don't do a deal. Everyone gets paid the amount that they put into the deal or we're not going to do it. So I'm definitely not savage where I'm going to take over and take advantage and, and all of that. But it's the approach with which we take, which goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning, discipline. So mm -hmm. if you want to be a savage, get on your face and do some push-ups. Mm -hmm. Love it, brother. Absolutely love it. Samurai, it's been a treat bringing you in here. Thank you so much, brother, for sharing your wisdom, your stories audience check it out of course every episode of our podcast has three parts to it so you get three episodes for the price of one we made it easy for you to digest understand how it's going to do we are smack dab in the middle of the very first season so check out the previous episodes of course listen to the other three parts with mr palmer here and of course mitch cabbage savage business the podcast a few things to pay attention to one this only works because of you i bring people that are wickedly smart having some success in life and business have lessons to pass along if you follow along and listen, you're going to learn stuff that's valuable and applies to you. Next, of course, sit there and subscribe. Get in there, click the button, follow along, get on all the channels, get it downloaded, ask questions, put in thoughts. And if you think you've got what it takes, go ahead and hit us up. You can drop comments almost anywhere. You can get after my team too and find out about becoming a guest on Savage Business, the podcast, or any of the other wicked properties we've got across our media group. Mr. Palmer, it's a pleasure, brother. Mitch Kamich, Savage Business, the podcast. Watch for the next episodes coming up. Check out the other two parts of this one. And of course, stay savage in business. Do what you got to do. And I will be seeing you next time on our next episode. Peace. Go get them.